meeting controls window. Okay, so I'm sharing. Participants can now see your screen alert. Screen and sharing the uh, the voice from the screen reader. That is Microsoft Zira. Uh, it's my chosen voice. And uh, <clears throat> so let me introduce. I am. My name is Joel Dodson. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in the in the Sunnyvale area. I've been a software developer um, over 20 years. Uh, more and more over 20 years. Uh, I've been Python uh, a little more recently. Um, you know, started in a C, C++, kind of the, the usual, uh, not usual, but uh, it's kind of a, a problem. Has joined the meeting alert. Common, um, a common path. Uh, in 2017, I, I lost my site. Uh, it was a sudden transition, sighted and unsighted. And I started to learn about accessibility. I was kind of uh, pushed into the into that domain by necessity. I prior to that, I knew absolutely nothing about accessibility. So you know, everything I say here is not from a, um, well, hopefully not sounding like I'm coming from a soapbox or a chip on the shoulder or anything. I I didn't know anything about accessibility prior to you know my livelihood depending on it, and I just want to you know, uh, you know encourage others and uh, educate, advocate, and all that good stuff. This talk is uh, I am going to be speaking at um, uh, Pi Bay. Uh, I just joined. I recently joined Pi uh, Bay Piggies uh, right before they sent out the uh, call for papers deadline coming up. I thought, hey, let me try uh, submitting a call about accessibility. You know, what's you know what's the worst I could say is no. Um, turns out it was worse. They said yes, and then I had to, had to put together a presentation. So, and um, then when Jeff sent out the note for this for tonight, I, I uh, said, hey, I've got a a short, uh, my presentation at the uh, Pi Bay is supposed to be 10 minutes. So I've got a uh, relatively short presentation. So let's, um, let me just get to it. Zoom two of nine. Um, Meeting controls one of nine. Zoom two of nine. Python and accessibility dash Google Chrome. Python and accessibility dash Google Chrome. Out of list home. So the slides are, are not complete, uh, but they are up on, uh, they're on GitHub. They're, um, as you can probably see, I don't know, is, is that, um, is that large enough? Should I uh, increase? I can. You can increase the font. Full screen alert. A couple Sorry, of times might be helpful. Can you increase uh, the font size at all? Uh, I think I can. You know, I know when the AL three Fred has joined the meeting alert. If not, don't worry. One hundred and twenty five percent alert. Did that? That that did increase the font size. Yeah, and what people can do also is there's a vertical bar. If you're in a, a normal alert. side by side view, you can drag it left and right, and to make the slides bigger and the speaker's picture smaller, or the other way around. So okay. that'll also helps. Plus, at the top, there's a view option. This is really for for everyone. Uh, you also have your view option for different sizes to increase font sizes. Thomas Choi has joined the meeting alert. Yeah. But we can see it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So the the slides um, kind of the, the outline is there. Uh, but these slides will be up uh, just, you know, in perpetuity, I guess, um, uh, as long as github.io is, is up, I suppose. Um, so if you do you know, want to go back and reference. Joel Dodson heading level two. Uh, GitHub repo for Python and accessibility okay. heading level. Kurt S. Dot, yeah. left paren, tilde to Seattle, right paren, you know, has joined Joel the meeting Dotson alert. Dot .io. And now my screen reader is going to tell you when somebody joins late, I'll try and hit control. and. Uh, to stop her from speaking. So, yeah, okay. So here we are about uh, Python and accessibility. Uh, it's it's not. There's not going to be a lot of Python. It's going to be more accessibility. But uh, you know, the the point I'm trying to make is why Python developers ought to know about and consider accessibility. Uh, so you know, this is just a uh, welcome to Python and accessibility. Joel Dodson heading level two. Pi Bay 2022 dash food truck edition heading September 10th, comma, 2020. See the GitHub repo for Python and accessibility for more notes and left paren. So I also right have a, um, some code heading level two. I also, I also have a GitHub repo uh, under um, github.com slash Joel Dotson slash um, Python and accessibility. It just has a readme right now, but it might at some point have some code maybe for uh, Beware or PyScript. Uh, I was just learning about FLET uh, yesterday, um, listening to a uh, Raymond has joined the alert. Python to me uh, podcast. He had the the creator of Flat on there. It's I'll, I'll talk about Raymond that. Raymond has joined the meeting alert. Um, Get up, Raymond has left the meeting alert. Get up, so, index of slides list with five items. What is accessibility? Question mark. Okay. So okay. So let's just what start is accessibility off with dash Python and accessibility. Next comma relevance to with, Python. With what is home Python and accessibility? Yeah. What is accessibility? Question mark. Heading so, one. So what is accessibility? As as with many things on the internet, there are plenty of definitions. 
or descriptions, attempted descriptions, broad descriptions. So I thought I would throw out another one. Um, it's Wrong, really, level two, my own shot at a definition. Yeah. I think of accessibility as understanding and appreciating who your users are, comma, how they might. Oops, sorry. Heading level two, I think of accessibility as understanding and appreciating who your users are, comma, how they might interact with your product based on their current abilities, comma, then using that understanding to guide the user experience design and user interface development. Dot. So I just thought I'd let uh, the screen reader read that out real quick. It's really about understanding, let's say, understanding who's using your product. And keep a broad mind about that because there are probably a lot more people using your product than you might realize. And they're probably using it, almost certainly using it in different ways than you realize. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have thought of the uh, minimum viable product where you get that out there and and you, it turns out that um, uh, you know, you've developed uh, maybe 30% uh, of the right thing and you've completely changed your product after that. So who your users are, uh, it's, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to, to understand. So just keep in mind, it's, it's highly likely, especially if you're developing a software application, it's highly likely you have a variety of users some in a permanent state and some in a sort of a temporary state of uh, different abilities. So you can see I've got- Interact uh, with your product based on their vision. current ability. List with five items, um, bullet vision dash. Perhaps some of your users have low or no vision, comma, or are temporary bullet hearing dash, or perhaps they don't tick yeah. T here well, comma, or at all, comma, or vision, are in some environment hearing, bullet mobility dash, or maybe um, they have temporary or permanent mobility issues and are not able to press small, comma, close together buttons yeah, on a touchscreen dot. Some people have uh, mobility. You know, some people have uh, tremors, uh, their, their hands shake or so forth. Um, I, I have a colleague, had a colleague who's had a, a conditional, um, connected tissue issue. And so he was unable to use uh, some iPhone apps that had the buttons really close together and the links were really small. Um, Bullet cognition dash or are dealing with cognitive challenges and are overwhelmed uh, by a very busy yeah, and crowded sure everybody here has opened up a website and it's just, it just blasts you in the face with content. Um, you know, and it's, it's kind of hard, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah, so that can be a challenge. Bullet developer dash you don't, tick um, T want to have to take your hands off the keyboard to use a mouse dot. And, you know, I think this one might resonate with, with all of us that, uh, you know, you like, you like keyboard shortcuts, right? I just did alt S to share my screen. I can do, um, you know, control to stop the screen reader from speaking. And so it really, it benefits, uh, accessibility has broad benefits, even beyond, you know, people who might be relying on it. Out of list, many people uh, are dealing, general. comma, to some degree, comma, then, with a combination of the situations listed above dot. You know, there are, like the, the blind deaf, um, there's a, there's a lady, uh, Hoppen, Hoppen Germa, Germa. Um, she's the first, uh, I think she has a, a book out, it was a couple of years ago, the first blind deaf woman to uh, tackle Harvard Law. She, she got her law degree from Harvard as a blind deaf woman, and it's a pretty amazing story. Uh, I recommend the book. Back uh, comma, welcome, next comma, relevance to, okay. relevance to Python dash Python and accessibility, yeah. Python and accessibility, heading level one relevance to Python, heading level two cool existing stuff, so, list with two items. Okay, <laughs> so here now we run into my incomplete slides. Uh, what I was, what I'm intending to talk about is why this is relevant to Python. So Python, you think of, you know, maybe machine learning or data science, data processing, you know, backend stuff, APIs and whatnot. Uh, but there are plenty of things that are done uh, front end with Python. Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows and, and loves to some degree Django. Um, and uh, you know, you might use Flask with Jinja um, and create uh, you know, some server side rendering uh, web applications. Uh, it's you know so you are uh, you know even in the in the Python uh, domain dealing with a lot of uh, potentially a lot of HTML and how do you generate that HTML how what is how do you form that HTML such that it's usable by a, a person with a screen reader uh, then another point I'll be putting in here is uh, new things that are coming out so things that are that are more about developing applications user um, with you with with user interfaces uh, beware uh, it's uh, well, I guess we're kind of new. It's several years old, but it's it's starting to get um, uh, some more love. Um, the creator is, is now uh, fully employed at Anaconda, working on Beware. Um, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, but anyway, and um, it's about developing uh, platform uh, desktop, um, Windows, Mac, Linux, and uh, mobile iOS, uh, Android apps. Uh, using native widgets, but uh, developing all that with Python, developing and packaging. Uh, Beware has a, a pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, packaging tool um, that uh, that's really, that's really helpful. Uh, and then PyScript, uh, probably at PyCon, a lot of people, uh, if you weren't there, you may have seen the videos of PyScript being announced, where it's using Python in the browser with uh, Pyodide, who is who are generating. Um, Kind of a subset of the C Python uh, 
uh, compiled down to WASM uh, bytecode, so you can run C Python in the browser through WebAssembly. Uh, it's, it's pretty slick. I've been playing around with it a lot. Um, <laughs> playing around with it when I should have been working on slides. Um, but hopefully, I'll I'll have a I'll have a demo of that in the um, uh, in that uh, GitHub repo I was talking about. Uh, and then, and then other things. Oh, so, so there's FLET, uh, which I was just learning about. F L E T. I think it's F L E T dot dev. Um, and on Talk Python to me, uh, Talk Python dot fn. There's a, a new. Uh, I think the recent podcast is with the uh, the um, creator of FLET, and it's based on the uh, um, Flutter uh, framework, and it's it's developing Python applications, um, you know, that are that can run uh, via the the Flutter infrastructure. And it, it, it it's, it's also um, desktop. Bullet batteries included native. frameworks, comma, e dot, bullet server side rendering with templates. Sorry. It's also desktop and native. Uh, so it's, that comma, so what is accessed next comma, standards and guidelines. Okay. Uh, please feel free to, to jump in uh, if you have questions. Uh, I'm not going to see the chat, so. I, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of push for React Native and this kind of scro infinite scrolling kind of pages anymore. Is there much of accessibility to those? Are those going to be viewed just like anything else um, uh, by just tabbing? Or or has there been a, a bit of a problem there? In infinite scroll is uh, it's problematic uh, because, yeah, tabbing is is often how, how one might navigate a, a website. Um, so that at the end, but yeah, once you get into an infinite scroll, then you can get you just get stuck there. Um, you know, you just you just going down the the Twitter um, the Twitter rat hole. Uh, you know, people put uh, you know their Twitter feed on their on their support site or something. Um, so yeah, infinite scroll can be can be problematic. Um, yeah, I think there are ways to to do that. If if I get stuck in an infinite scroll, then I'll I'll often just go to the bottom of the screen, the bottom of the page, and then and tab up to try and find what I'm looking for. Um, maybe use some different form of navigation. But uh, React Native, I haven't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that I've used a, a mobile app uh, with React Native. Um, I'm not really a big fan of mobile apps. I use, uh, I use um, um, uh, Overcast to listen to podcasts. Uh, I use Outlook for, for Gmail. Um, and I use, um, um, for uh, audiobooks, um, um, Audible for audiobooks, and uh, and then messaging. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm I've, I've been kind of turned off of uh, of mobile apps uh, recently. I've gotten gotten a bit frustrated with iOS. Um, <clears throat> iOS seems to have a. Oh, sorry. Is it, go ahead. Is it because of the accessibility issues? It's just not as accessible as it used to be, uh, audibly. It's. Yeah, iOS is is known as kind of the gold standard of accessibility for mobile, um, and then uh, so it's VoiceOver is the screen reader on iOS, and they have VoiceOver on Mac OS as well. The nice thing is that they try to make those consistent experiences, uh, so the way something works, you know, to to the extent possible. And obviously, uh, a mobile interface is different than a than a desktop interface, but um, you know they try to make the navigation pretty consistent, which I which I like. And I was using a Mac. Uh, before losing my sight, so I tried to to use VoiceOver on Mac OS, um, but it's just very buggy on Mac OS. And then on iOS, I started iOS 10, uh, and I was getting pretty good at it. And then I woke up one morning and said, "Welcome to iOS 11." Yeah. <laughs> I thought, uh -oh. <laughs> and sure enough, there are all kinds of all kinds of bugs with VoiceOver, and I just I've kind of not recovered from that. I unfortunately have a, a long memory of uh, a frustration, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it's still, it still is, uh, it's considered the gold standard, but I don't know. I, I seem to think they have a, a, a lower um, <clears throat> uh, barrier for um, uh, stop ship, um, you know, bugs for uh, voiceover, um, you know, which, you know, it's, it's, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it seems to be, uh, you know, they might, they might seem to ship, it seems to me that they ship bugs and voiceover that uh, were those bugs in the uh, just the regular iOS it would probably hold back the release but <clears throat> anyway, that's a <laughs> that's one blind person's opinion and and uh, I would say is maybe not shared across the uh, the spectrum. 
to give everyone else more time, I'll only ask one more question. Sorry, Jeff, if that's going over. Um, so one of the things that I find as a developer is I often want to be more accessible, but I don't always have someone who can help me test. I don't know all the accessibility options. So for example, are there volunteer groups or <laughs> if I wanted to be bold, if I gave you a particular page, would you go over right now and just see how accessible it is? Maybe we don't want to do it now just to save some, time, <laughs> some embarrassment. You can, if you want, it depends on the time that we have, uh, yeah. but how does that work? I mean, I find that a lot of developers want to, but just, you know, until they're like caught out with a mistake, they don't really know. And so like, how do you be proactive with that? Like we have tons of linters, we have tons of processes with CI, but we don't have a really a good tester for, for accessibility. Yeah, there are some static tools. Um, you know, Lighthouse uh, does have some stuff in there for testing accessibility, but it'll test for things like, uh, do your buttons have you know, labels associated with it? From Eric Crowell to everyone colon, aside from what Tick has been mentioned, comma, are there any specific packages slash modules for Python for accessibility that I should look at question mark? Alert. Oh. <laughs> um, so I am hearing the, uh, the questions. I think it's serious feedback to me. Um, but yeah, the, the static tools are, are um, kind of infamously uh, known for, for not, um, uh, not being very effective. Uh, getting, you know, depends on who you're listening to, you know, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the, uh, of the problems. Uh, with accessibility, uh, especially when you know with single page apps um, or progressive web apps or whatever, right? you just download you download something and it's you know the the body is empty and you've got a you know just a whole load of JavaScript that comes in. It's really hard to uh, to test that with a static. In fact, it's it's really impossible to test that with a static analysis to see if that site is accessible because you know who knows what that JavaScript is doing. It's very difficult. But there are some uh, there's a company, and I'm, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I will put that information um, in the uh, let me. Uh, no next link. Back comma. What is accessibility question from Thomas Choi to everyone colon? I think there is next comma standards and guidelines. Okay. Um, standards and guidelines dash Python and accessibility. Back comma relevance to Python. Next comma. Yeah. Exam so oh. <laughs> standards and guidelines is a little, it's a little shy of content right now. But I will, I will be putting in here uh, some references, uh, some links um, initially to the W3C. Uh, where they're talking about uh, the accessibility, um, the standards prior to WCAG. Uh, and I'll also put in here some some links to various sites. From Monty Dadadoff know. to everyone, colon, do you have any advice for working with a programmer with low or no vision? Question mark. Are there any coding style issues to keep in mind? Question mark. Alert. <laughs> oh boy. Um, yeah, um, that is that is a good question. Um, I can, uh, sorry, I'm, I think I'm going beyond the lightning uh, around of time, but uh, I'm I'm certainly happy to stick around and talk more about this after the other the other talk as well uh, to answer more questions and even to look at sites. Um, but uh, I'll I'll put a I'll be I'll have a bunch of references in here to you know places where you can do do testing uh, and and resources that can can help with testing. Um, you know, probably not volunteer, but um, you know, probably not. Uh, uh, you know, it's there. There's a variety of, you know, there are big companies that you know they want to go and you know contract with the with the Verizons and the uh, Comcasts and whatnot. And, you know, they have you know hundreds of thousand dollar contracts, but they're also smaller companies as well. But, and I'll and I'll put that in here. Um, uh, <clears throat> let's see. So so yeah, this I'll just skip over this the standards. I'll I'll be filling that in, um, <clears throat> and. This uh, I get I get uh, almost two weeks to to really um, nail this down uh, for the uh, Pi Bay just, uh, talk and and um, you know if you're not going to Pi Bay I think they're all going to be up on on um, YouTube afterwards so so hopefully this this talk will be much more coherent uh, at that point. Um, uh, you see, so you want me to answer the other questions now, or, or shall I? Yeah, this would probably be a good time. You want to? Yeah. We can start from the. I can reread them. Uh, to you. Uh, so from Eric, aside from what's been messaged or mentioned, are there specific packages, modules for Python for accessibility that I should look at? Not, not, not really. Um, WX, um, is it WX Python, WX widgets, WX Python. Uh, they do have, <clears throat> they're, they're known for being, um, uh, being able to create accessible UIs through WX Python. Uh, and they do have uh, WX Python uh, accessibility um, 
I don't know if it's a, a widget or it's a part of a, you add it to widgets. I haven't actually done any UI programming uh, with Python. I've started developing, um, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna advertise this it's, it's very, very early on, but developing a set of classes that will generate uh, HTML. Um, it's, it's all under, um, it's on GitHub, it's open source on GitHub. Uh, you can actually, under my, under my Joel Dots and GitHub account, you can see the, um, it's actually under something called ACLU for accessible command line utilities. There's a UI directory in there where I've, where I've started this little project of building out um, classes that will render into HTML. And I'm trying to build into those classes uh, accessibility features um, that, so you can generate an element like a, like a table, you can generate a table from that and it will put in there things like row span and column span in that table, which helps with navigation. Um, which I can I can show that briefly, but but yeah, there's not there's not a whole lot um, to really help uh, with accessibility, and that's when I've been looking into at PyScript at their examples, and it seems like it's it's kind of there, but maybe um, yeah, I'm going to try and go in and look at this the source and see if there's some things it can add that that do you know may, maybe more tightly couple uh, things like check boxes with the label for the checkbox. Because uh, sometimes I hear it, sometimes I don't. But um, I think it's things like that, like you know, PyScript, uh, Beware, Flat. Um, if we can build accessibility into those tools, such that you kind of get it, you know, out of the box, um, yeah, I think that would be a, a big step forward for accessibility. Um, right. So we have a, an interesting question from Monty. So, do you have any advice for working with a programmer with low or no vision? Are there any coding style issues to keep in mind? And I guess a follow-on question I have for that is, how does indentation work out for you? Does it make it easier or harder? Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of like uh, Python. Um, there's a, a list, program-l at uh, freelists.org uh, with a bunch of uh, blind software developers on there. And there was a debate on there about why do why do blind people like Python? And um, uh, and, the, and the indentation, of course, is kind of the uh, you know, one of the big questions. In the screen reader, I use a screen reader and I use VS Code, and I can set my screen reader to beep and to speak the number of spaces, um, <laughs> because you know, God forbid I ever use tabs. Right? Um, anyway, to speak the uh, the number of spaces in a in an indentation, um, and it also you know kind of like a kind of like a haiku. Um, it forces me to to structure my code. Um, better in a sense that um, yeah I've gotten points where I've got you know maybe a 15 line code with you know four you know three four levels deep and then coming back out and I think I gotta I gotta clean this up I can't figure out where the where the heck I am um, so it, it um, in a sense the uh, you know what some people might call a, a limitation <clears throat> forces uh, forces some structure uh, on me so it's yeah, I, I take that perspective on it. That's, you know, liking that. And then also just the fact that I can, um, <laughs> for better or for worse, I can do so much in a single line of code with, uh, you know, comprehensions or or whatnot, you know, that may or may not, that's, I suppose, arguably, whether that's a good um, uh, good behavior <laughs> or not. But, you know, you can you can write some pretty, some pretty uh, clean uh, code in Python, which, which I, I think, but, you know, I can say that here on a on a Python interest group, right? Yeah. So I yeah, guess for, that someone with deep, deeply nested code would be harder for you, I guess. This would. Yeah, it gets it gets a little harder um, if it's nested and there's you know two three lines uh, per per block. It's not so bad if it gets nested and there's um, you know half dozen ten ten lines. You know, it's, if it gets if it starts getting long, then it gets a little more complicated. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like any code. It might take me a little longer to get familiar with the code, but once I am, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's, I don't find it to be too bad. Um, yeah. And I do turn on when I'm, when I'm coding, I turn on all punctuation. Uh, so, you know, I, I get to hear all the uh, colons and commas and, and whatnot. Um, and I don't have to listen to a lot of curly brackets, except I, I do like F strings. So I do get to hear curly brackets. 
for F strings, but um, yeah. Uh, as far as working with a, a blind or low vision developer, uh, <laughs> patience is good, but you know, it's, I guess, kind of working with any developer or is working with anybody in general. Um, and, you know, understanding that um, there's, there's um, a high value of independence and, you know, certainly, you know, with, I can only really speak to the, to the blind community and only, you know, obviously I don't speak for the entire blind community, um, but, uh, you know, I can only speak to my experience with, with blindness and other people and, you know, being independent is, is a huge um, desire, I don't know how to phrase, uh, and, you know, not, and just being treated like everyone else, really, I think is kind of what blind people are, are wanting, you know, looking for, wanting, you know, just, I'm just another developer. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm trying to reach out, one of the reasons I submitted a talk is because I want to go out uh, kind of into, you know, be more, um, um, <laughs> be more visible in the developer community as, you know, there's this, you know, he's a blind developer and no, he's, he's just, just another developer. Um, he's got opinions I disagree with, um, you know, opinions I do agree with, uh, you know, he, he likes coding, he likes solving problems. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of really great, um, you know, really solid Python developers and, um, or blind developers, you know, in, in a variety of, of technologies. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would say just, you know, get to know him or her, um, they, you know, uh, and, you know, just kind of ask them, how do you, you know, how would you like to, to work? How is it best to work together? Uh, you know, what can I do? How do you like uh, documentation? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be hard to not generate, um, you know, diagrams. You might say, you know, hey, this is a, you know, here's a diagram, uh, architecture diagram, you know, topology, network topology diagram, you know, uh, why don't we get together? I can I can go over that and give you the high level description of, of this diagram. So just you know, being helpful, um, you know, not not um, not in a condescending way. I'm sure I'm sure nobody here would do that. But uh, you know, just being helpful is you know, here's a colleague, um, you know, has got some areas that you know he or she might need some help, um, you know, but also has a you know a lot of experience, um, and uh, you know, it's just just another you know another person like like you and me. I think that's, yeah. and say hi. You'd be amazed how many times I'm walking along and somebody just kind of whooshes past me. And I'm like, what the? And uh, I say, man, why you just don't sneak up on a blind person. Just say, hey, how you doing? You know, you know passing you on the right or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, if somebody says passing you on the right and they're coming toward me, they're almost inevitably wrong uh, and they're passing me on the left, <laughs> but, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's nice to just to speak up and say hi and be friendly. And that's that would be my main suggestions. Um, Great. Well, uh, thanks a lot. This has been a really informative and interesting mm -hmm. talk. Perfect. So today I wanted to talk about continuous feedback and open telemetry, which kind of became my favorite topics uh, to speak about both uh, kind of uh, to other developers uh, that, that I talk to a lot uh, or or just on meetups and other places, just because I, I kind of see a lot of potential here. And I'm really excited about the concept. So I wanted to share it with you and, and kind of see how you react and, and what your thoughts are about it. Uh, just some brief uh, background about me. Uh, I'm a board game geek. It's kind of the past. Sorry, that was my mistake, Ronnie. I just muted you. Could you unmute, please? Apologize. Oh. <laughs> no worries. So um, uh, I'm a board game geek, which basically is the only hobby I managed to sneak in uh, between work and family and the rest of the things. But uh, really enjoying that. And the more cumbersome, weird, and complex and finicky the game is, the more I enjoy it. Um, I've always kind of been multi-classing different types of uh, skills and, and, and kind of refused to narrow myself down to a definition, uh, which was kind of 
a tragedy because you know as, as a developer i would always kind of look over the shoulder at the spec and want to kind of end on the design and when i got to be a product manager i kind of couldn't bear not being able to code uh, and I've been transitioning between different roles and kind of inventing made a position that allowed me to balance these uh, things. Uh, but as a part of that, both as a product manager, a developer, an architect, uh, um, team lead, uh, all of these things, um, all of these different positions, I was always kind of very evidence based in the way that I like to approach things. And I was really fascinated by how do we create scalable processes within the team? How do we actually create um, software in a better way? Because a lot of times, and I love that about software, it kind of feels that we're inventing the wheel. We're kind of you know, charting new territory and, and kind of doing experimentation about what works and what doesn't, which may or may not be the case with more traditional industries that have, you know, uh, much more of a, a culture and background and and kind of established ways of doing things. Um, and recently, I started something new about that with Digma, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about that later because it's it's kind of related to the topic. Now, the most important thing about uh, kind of my experimentation with dev processes and how to optimize them is that when I looked at, like, again, very critically uh, at where I, I was spending most of my time, it seemed like I was trying to optimize two things. I was trying to uh, make sure that we release the right features, and I was trying to make sure that we deliver them quickly. The continuous integration, continuous deployment was something that I spent a lot of time kind of perfecting with my teams. Uh, we were looking at uh, kind of all of the latest and greatest uh, tools that were available to us to make sure that we accelerate the releases as much as pos possible. And I think everybody's been doing that, right? It's kind of been the, uh, the one of the biggest changes we've seen um, from uh, the way we used to code a while back. But this made me think about that something was missing here. And I want to illustrate that to you um, from the point of view of a developer, a made up developer I named Bill. Uh, and Bill's mission is to get code into production. And this is, um, he's using all of the greatest CI tools. He's writing tests, of course. Um, and he has GitOps as a process to, to get his changes into production. And what happened to Bill over the years was that uh, the definition of done kind of became more and more inclusive of more activity. So when I got started uh, with development 20 years ago, um, it was, you know, I'm done with this feature. Now, QA, you take it, come back to me if there are any bugs. And that was that, right? The, then, you know, some arguing ensued about whether it's a feature or a bug or was it included, was it not included? And, and that was basically what we did. But today, as we're kind of shifting right, we're saying that, yeah, it's not enough to code a feature and say, okay, guys, take it from here. Um, it's not even enough to write unit tests, integration tests, kind of maybe a test plan and automation around what you're doing. Although, you know, write test, it's, it's important. Um, and it's become customary to also take care of the deployment. If you've added a new service, how do you deploy it? Make sure that that it, it deploys and, and you see it with, with your own eyes kind of deploying into production. And developers kind of took on a lot of responsibilities to be able to do all of those things. And you see, I think across the industry and in the companies that I worked at as well, QA becoming a bit more scarce with developers taking automation responsibilities. So sometimes you have automation teams and so on. DevOps is kind of being integrating somewhat into dev uh, in some cases, or at least moving a bit left from IT. And, and this process kind of makes it, it makes sense because it promotes ownership. So Bill that we're discussing here wants to push in a change that, that, that he's very proud of. And he's gone through all of these different stages and he finished with the deployment phase. Um, the question is, what happens now? Because right now it is already in production. What would be the next thing that Bill should do at that point? Um, any ideas? You can put them in the chat. 
if you are the developer and you're done with the, the development, you're done with the testing, you've just deployed it. Um, yeah, measure and monitor for sure. So definitely the next thing I want to make sure that happened is that if I introduced a change, it's the right change. So for example, I recently refactored um, a database query and some data access logic around that. And I made the assumption that this is going to improve things. It certainly did in my testing, but I'm not sure whether it will actually do that in real life. And what Bill wants to know is exactly as I wanted to know is that did my code work well? Is 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 it being used right? I, I can't tell you how many situations I've seen where code was just being you know if one if statement away from being used, but it wasn't, and you were very proud of your code, but nobody was ever hitting it. Um, and you want to kind of understand the changes even beyond the changes that you were trying to introduce into the system, if that makes sense. So I thought to myself, well, I want to know all of these things, right? I want to monitor and measure, but I, I'm not interested in monitoring in the sense of, I don't want to know when production is down. I don't want to kind of look into the system in general. I, I'm looking at my code and, and this is what I want to measure. I want to know how I did. And I was looking at this um, kind of by now, I think completely, uh, overused uh, kind of infinity sign diagram of the DevOps loop. And I was noticing something was really off about it. And this replicated actually in a couple of versions. Other ones are, are a bit different, but a couple of versions of this diagram had kind of the same gap or mission within them. And if you've seen the title of this talk, then you probably know that I'm referring to continuous feedback because it seems, and, and you know, I, I have the source for this. Uh, uh, image uh, some, somewhere online, and it has so many tools like associated with so many different stages of the DevOps loop. And for some reason, somebody thought to associate Salesforce with continuous feedback, which I can't really get. But what it means is that there is a gap between uh, deploying the features and measuring them and kind of understanding whether I've improved the world or made it infinitely worse. And the thing is that um, most developer I know, and you know, by now, kind of being unsure of this hunch, I went and, and talked to a lot of developers, some of them friends, some of them kind of reached out to them as a part of this kind of research project. I kind of like to reach things um, and, and, and try to find out, are your developers measuring things in production? What are your developers doing with the data that you already have in production? And this confirmed my, my kind of an original assessment that there is really a big gap here. Uh, and what we know as monitoring is very uh, kind of reactive and, and more kind of, okay, something terrible has happened. What do we do about it? And less something that you would design or, or use uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, job as a developer. Now, it doesn't help that once we've, released a new feature. And this is something that I've kind of experienced from the other end as a product manager is that you're always biased towards the next feature. Like um, you, you've, you've released this awesome feature and the product manager is happy. And then he's saying, well, uh, but I have a roadmap to advance, right? And what about this next one? And this in many organizations, again, it's not something that's uh, absolute, but in many organizations, it causes um, technical debt and features to be deprioritized simply because we don't know. We, we kind of, we're done with that for now. We're moving on to the next one. And we don't know if we'll go back to that code ever again. So my personal experience from all of these trends that I've been noticing was after taking a, a, a very hard look at, at the processes that I've introduced, was that what we're really doing is throwing features over the fence, but at shorter intervals when we're doing continuous deployment, if we haven't introduced some feedback processes into the loop. So it's nice to be to be releasing all the time, but if you're not learning anything from these releases, you've solved something that has to do with the process, which you know, agile development, incremental, all, all of the things that were we, that that work so well have done but you're not really improving uh, on the quality of your code and you're accumulating a lot of that. 
So the next question that I thought to myself, well, um, if that is the situation and I want to, to, to actually close that loop and I think that continuous improvement and continuous feedback is something that could be helpful, but if only I actually had access to objective data about my code, then all of my problems would be solved and I'll be able to, to actually integrate that into the process. And this is basically what's leading into this talk. So we just discussed why we need feedback and I hope everybody agrees that feedback is important and actually can help. And we'll actually look at some more concrete examples about what type of feedback as a developer would actually improve my code tremendously. Um, but the next question is what data can I get out of my application? What's available today? And then, and the most important one is what can I do with that data once I have it? Um, so these are the things that that I want to look to look at today. So the first important thing that happened uh, that really kind of um, helped fuel me even more on this topic was the fact that open telemetry was released. I could swear there was a title here that said open telemetry, but it must have uh, been uh, erased somehow. Um, so open telemetry has been released. I think it reached GA for tracing like eight months ago, maybe a bit more. So it's relatively new, but it, it's it's extremely significant. And the reason it is so significant from, in my opinion, looking at this kind of uh, from the outside in, is that suddenly everyone agreed on something that is open and that can, you can count on. So there has been so many different observability standards and proprietary agents by, you know, I'll try not to, uh, to be unfair to any company, I'll just mention a lot of them. So Datadog and the New Relics and the Dynatrace and the Grafana, every, each of them had their own thing. And there was OpenTrace and, and there was OpenCensus and there was a, so many standards that it was very hard to count on what standard the data is going to be um, kind of modeled as to provide value on top of it. So once everybody agreed and, and decided, okay, this is going to be the standard. And if you go to all of the major APMs and their websites, you're gonna see Otel kind of starting to lead uh, the charge as the way that they're going to gather and the way that they're modeling the data. It opened the door for open source and, and ecosystem tools to start appearing that provide value on top of that uh, specification. The next thing that's important about open telemetry is that it's not just about tracing and it's not just about logging. It's not about just about metrics. They're even looking into profiling now. It's basically an, an inclusive standard that kind of looks at the problem of the ability end to end. And this starts to kind of organize your world as a developer. I was never sure when to log, when to trace, what metrics to collect. And by having kind of one framework to encompass it all, you're starting to kind of organize um, the way that you're working and 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 your view about which observability should be included in your code is something that's more whole product. And the last thing, and it, this is equally important, is that and because and probably it also stems from that first um, reason I mentioned, which is that everybody finally settled their minds on what it's going to be, is that all of the platforms, libraries programming languages are including it either as separate pipe packages, as you can see with some technologies, we'll take a look at some examples soon. Or sometimes, for example, I think .NET just made it a part of the standard library. It's very easy to use system diagnostics or whatever they call that, that, that package and use it. But whichever type of integration exists, and Java is also doing crazy things with kind of injecting things into uh, bytecode injection and, and making sure that uh, you don't even need to modify your code to get it up and running. But the important thing is that if I wanted to enable observability tomorrow on the project that I'm using and start having access to all of that data, it's become extremely simple. 
Uh, and we'll see an example in a sec. Uh, the, the, all of these packages already exist. People are working on them. I think Otel has, uh, I saw an article that it was kind of the second most active open source project after Kubernetes or something like that. So it's, it's, it's getting a lot of steam, a lot of traction. Um, and all of these things just make it a breeze or kind of a, more of an experience of turning on the lights than anything else to start using observability in your code. So just, a, and I won't go very deep, although I can continue and maybe dive into it a little deeper later, um, but the how does open telemetry work? So what I like about open telemetry is that there's not a lot of magic. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of tools and frameworks that kind of create all of these different layers of abstraction or kind of add profilers on top of your code and slow it down and do all sorts of things that that kind of make me think twice about using them. Otel is, is just, uh, for example, tracing and open telemetry is kind of like logging. You can include it, you can uh, apply it automatically to some higher level function, um, and it will simply report um, and send that message out asynchronously, of course, to um, a component that is called a collector. A collector is just a container, like usually we just started with a container, and it's basically a router. It tells, uh, it has a, a simple YAML file, and we'll, we'll see that how that YAML file looks like. And that YAML file just has definitions about where am I getting observability data from and where do I send it? So for example, to continue naming other APM tools without insulting anybody, uh, you can get information, uh, logging information from your app and throw it at logs. And you can get tracing data and throw it at CoreLogix, or you can get uh, metrics and throw it at Prometheus. So all of these things are just things that, that are very easy to configure outside of your application because you have this very modular unit that can ingest the data and then route it as you define your data kind of observability pipeline. And more interestingly, it can kind of merge together different types of insights from different layers. So it can be telemetry from your code and telemetry from Kubernetes. And sometimes it's very interesting and the opportunity to, to actually um, find the correlations uh, is very interesting there. So to actually give you a more um, concrete example of what uh, open telemetry and continuous feedback looks like in practice. I created this sample repo. Um, I was, I, I have to say, I didn't want to create a repo, but I was searching desperately for an example about Otel and observability and code in general that didn't revolve around CRUD apps that have like zero domain logic or very thin, and you can't really see anything interesting there. And I couldn't find anything. It was all about how do you install open telemetry? How do you activate it? So I'll, I'll kind of say that as a caveat, I'm not going to talk about how to install and activate open telemetry just because there's so many great guides and tutorials by now on how to do it. I'm, I'm kind of, I have nothing to contribute there. What I did want to create was this repo and we'll take a look in the code, at, at the code in a sec is understand what can we do to, uh, to use observability with a more complex project where we have multiple types of technologies and we want to understand things about it. How do we make it useful? And I saw some questions in the chat and before I kind of charge on and let me kind of uh, see if I can address them. Uh, would A-B testing and Canary deploys help with that feedback? Definitely, but again, I would ask, what is the feedback that you're collecting from these feature flags and Canary deploy? So, Yes, I've seen uh, many organizations that create these feature flags and what 99% of them were doing is there was a feature flag, okay, I've deployed my code, 10% of the users see it or, or whatnot. And I move on to the next ask, unless something catastrophic happens. And then the code gets merged in and then four weeks later, traction is growing on this new feature and everything collapses. So the it's definitely helpful yeah I'm, 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 I think it's a great practice but I always think about you know beyond just the, the buzzword or, or or kind of the capability itself what are you actually measuring what are you actually looking at uh, to make sure that it works and by 
the way, the same thing with testing. There, there's a, a lot of testing that can provide great value, but you know, if if you're only testing to your assumptions, if you're only creating tests that kind of follow the happy path, then you can create a million tests and your coverage will be awesome, but it may not be kind of giving you the the, the value that it could. Um, can these open telemetry exporter be exported to Prometheus? So yes, you can export metrics as well. I think Prometheus has been, the metric standard is a bit younger than the tracing standard in terms of maturity. Um, but um, I think Prometheus already can, can, can work with it. I think there are a few glitches that I noticed on my project, uh, but if you actually go to the, to the re repo, um, it actually includes Grafana and Prometheus and other tools. Um, okay, last question for now, and then we'll continue later. Does OpenTelemetry have a handler for the Python standard library logging package? Yes, it does. So if you look at uh, OpenTelemetry instrumentation logging, then it has this neat feature where it actually instruments the logs and uh, it um, adds the tracing context automatically. So basically you're able to, and, and tools do that, like tools that we look at in a sec, like Jaeger and others, you can actually associate the log with the trace so that you know exactly uh, what it's uh, related to. So with that, let's continue. So I uh, in this sample code repo, and this is the architecture that, that I've created, um, I wanted to include a variety of services, do something that's a bit more realistic, um, of course, it's not realistic since it's supposed to be the API for the Gringotts vault because that was the movie that I was watching with my kids at the time. Uh, but still, it was uh, it was trying to to create some situation where there is more domain logic uh, going on, and it's more interesting to see uh, how behaviors change. I was using Fast API, RabbitMQ, um, on a worker service that was running uh, to to carry on the job. Uh, Postgres as the database, and an external API that I uh, made up with some fake uh, fake API website to to actually handle the exchange rates between Mogul money and the Wizarding World currency. Now, the one thing that stood out as I was getting started was that I had to do nothing about instrumentation. Like I, this is kind of a partial list. Of a, I tried to capture from PyP, but there is a tremendous amount of different instrumentation libraries. They're all being maintained, developed. I think by now, or by the way, these versions are a bit obsolete. Uh, this is when I took the screenshot, but the experience of activating instrumentation was just, okay, this is the technology. Does it have instrumentation? Install the package, turn it on, move on to the next one. So within like 20 minutes, I was looking at this architecture right here, having zero data, be like except for logs maybe about what's going on. And just by kind of enabling all of these automatic instrumentations, all of these kind of uh, purple diamond shapes that you see here um, are probes or data points that I started getting information from. So for example, fast API is a great instrumentation. It, it was starting to feed me information about requests. Um, Pika, which is the, I think, uh, one, of, one of the popular libraries to use for Rabbit, um, was starting to give me information about like what's going on with my consumers and producers and so on. Um, SQL Alchemy, I was using as an ORM for some, uh, some of the flows and, and the, in the backend server was was sending information. All of these different libraries were just flooding me with a lot of data. And this was awesome because it kind of validated my assumption that in today's modern application, and especially with OTEL, data is not that hard to get. Now with OpenTelemetry, you can also add manual instrumentation to your code, which I recommend because it allows you to kind of like logging, kind of organize, uh, different contexts in your code and say, okay, this is when this activity starts and, and run it in that context and, and open telemetry will kind of monitor different things about it. Um, setting the collector up, and if you remember from what I was kind of explaining before, the collector is kind of the router for all of these observability um, uh, data streams. 
it was again a piece of cake starting a container uh creating the uh, don't worry this uh, token is expired so yeah it's it's fine that uh, that you're saying it um but you you can actually see kind of all of the different exporters that i was using um and eventually you created a pipeline which you see kind of uh, uh below there where you, for example you can see traces like I don't know why the mouse doesn't work, but basically you see uh, under service pipelines traces, you have receivers, exporters, and processors. This is basically the pipeline. So you receive open telemetry, then you run it. In my case, I sent it to various services. And finally, the processor is a very common one that just batches it. So it's not very chatty and, and it kind of takes, I don't know, uh, a specific amount of traces, batches them up, and sends them in bulk. Other so, question you want yeah. if you've got time for a question from the audience um, from Raksha do you happen to know any documentation that explains the parameters of that collector config file yeah it's very well documented like um that's why I mentioned that kind of the setting up of hotel is the easy part so just look up the hotel collector I know a lot of people who are actually adding documentation there uh, that I talk to that work as a part of the hotel uh, project um and it, it, it's it's a very open uh and, and easy to extend there, i think there, there's a lot of talk these days about collector ops as well kind of how do you kind of manage them but it has a lot of useful capabilities i think the collector by itself could be the the, the topic of of, uh, of a great uh, technical talk okay thank you right um so Let's just kind of, uh, these are the tools that I that I wanted to use. All Everything I'm using is open source um, because, you know, why not? And, and, and there are so many great, great tools out there. Um, and let me show you kind of, um, just do, uh, this is what the repo uh, look, looks like. Um, it has all of these different technologies that I mentioned. Um, and I've made it very convenient convenient to experiment with so I created kind of dockerized versions of everything so basically starting the observability stack to start a docker file it will set up everything um, if you want to uh, start the application itself you don't need to bother with virtual environments I was having a lot of pain with some of the libraries compatibility with apple silicon and things like that so just start a docker it will work uh, seeding with sample that data, which I actually found online in a machine learning website where they were actually offering some data sets for wizards in the wizarding world and some of their stats, which which I thought was was nice to incorporate. So you can do that as well. Um, and eventually this will get you to kind of a working uh, API um, that has um, several kind of operations and that Kind of works this end to end from the worker thread which uh, of course like the worker uh, kind of consumer which i, I of course uh, called the goblin worker in 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 green Gods, to the uh, actually starting the, the the appraisal process let's say for a vault um, and then kind of seeing everything as one big distributed workload that you want to track and glean important information from so the first thing that, and, and this is very easy to follow along, I, I really believe in kind of trying to make it as easy as possible for people to get started and then they can kind of go over everything and understand kind of how the clock works. But um, once uh, you start this, you will also see that all of these observability tools are, are there. So for example, uh, Jaeger um, is a great uh, tool that allows you to, uh, to look at traces. So let me make this a bit bigger. Bigger. So um, it's it's really a great tool. In this case, let's let's look at the vault service. I think I've used this. Um, and if I kind of just run it, uh, you can see different traces or different workflows that are happening in my system. For example, this one looks pretty slow. It's nine seconds. It's the appraisal uh, process. And if I click on it. I can actually see a visualization of everything that happened to from the minute that I created the request. And what you see here is actually all of these different instrumentation libraries contributing so that they see a complete picture. This is where I didn't have to work hard. So the first thing uh, came from FastAPI, which kind of contributed 
the the, the initial instrumentation um, and and told me that uh, this was an HTTP call and so on. Uh, then you have uh, the the database instrumentation that tells me kind of what uh, what 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 are the select statements that were executed and so on. And I can kind of find out where the where the time went, which is a very interesting property and and very useful one for traces. For example, here I can see that uh, I, I spent um, five seconds here, which is uh, a lot uh, on this uh, requesting uh, vault upraise. And, and this is something that would help me as a developer to kind of dig a little deeper and understand exactly how this affected uh, my 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 um, kind of how the how the code works first, and then how my changes may have affected it. And to make that easier, uh, the and one nice thing, let me kind of maybe add a minimum duration, of, let's say five seconds, to make it interesting. Um, so one interesting thing that they did was also allow you to compare. Uh, uh, different traces. So, for example, if I see one trace that uh, takes that, that's very short, and one trace that's very long, um, if it's the same operation, in this case, let me just choose different ones just to demonstrate. Uh, by doing compare, I can see what's different between them. In this case, these are different operations. So, of course, everything. But it's very interesting because I could have operations where you know the median time would be very quick, but for the what's called the p95 or the p95 or 99 that the kind of edge percentile are getting much slower responses so it's interesting to take two traces and compare them similar to before and after change right you you might you might want to take uh look at a trace before you introduce your change look at the trace after um uh, and see if that uh like what made the difference you can actually there are a lot of, of interesting things uh, here, but uh, I think you can actually also look at, for example, a specific operation, uh, and then you can compare. For example, this one was set six seconds, was one, four seconds. Both of them are tremendously slow, but you can see exactly what happened, what was missing in 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 one, and and was there for the other. So this is a very neat feature that I use a lot um, to kind of understand the code. Uh, the other thing that I got for free just by having hotel our tools like prometheus so um this gave me dashboards and and i won't go into it because i, I, just, I do want to to make sure we're on time but uh the, all of the examples are here and basically you can set up like within a second the dashboard it just tells you metrics about your service and the requests and i think the most important thing is that it's no longer something that's very complicated um so all of the all of this code is is available here. Um, I really recommend uh, taking a look because I think Otel is is a very important technology, and I think that the potential to give us more information is 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 really something that we can use in in our processes. So all of these tools that I just mentioned are 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 really great. Um, but I thought that while well, I, I was very much minded, and this came to me as I was using and, and trying to practice continuous feedback, is that I wasn't really thinking about it. I was thinking very linearly. So it's true that you can introduce a code change and then get it into production and then start measuring it and see what it has done. But remember, it's a circle. It's a loop, right? So it's continuous. It's not just about when I roll my changes, I can start measuring it. But even before I start rolling my changes, I can, if I have that information, I can start asking really important questions about it. So in our example before with Bill, even before he got started, what if he could ask, well, who is using this code? Is it used? What's my impact radius here in terms of the other microservices? What are issues I should already know about? Maybe I'll fix them in this same kind of uh, pull request or a separate one. Or maybe I should just need to know about them because I will know that I'm not the one that's causing this timeout. It just happens. Um, what should I optimize for, right? Because I've, I've seen a lot of developers, and I think somebody from an observability company, like ironically enough, told me that, that he was code reviewing 
um, features written by his developers. And he was saying, you know, I, I'm seeing developers that are spending tremendous amount of time trying to optimize for code that gets called maybe once a week. And then this other piece of code that's at the center of the system, like any second and added there will kind of have a ripple effect on every conceivable flow, but they don't see it because just look at the code. And if they don't have kind of the 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 tribal knowledge or the expertise, then they, they just kind of go past it and, and they don't and, and it doesn't stand out. Um, how does this code work in real life? You know, what kind of how, how does it scale? Is it does it scale well? And then after introducing the changes, even before it gets to production, somebody's, as I mentioned, reviewing it. So um, and, and reviewing code is considered a very, you know, I, I don't like it very much. And a lot of developers don't as well because it distracts you from what you were doing and suddenly you're context switching. And it's very hard, especially if somebody is making a big change to start knowing what you should focus on. So the same information could also help me focus on kind of what are the right changes. And, and it's... It's kind of everywhere you look, the information could be very useful. I kind of started modeling it kind of as as different use cases where um, where this could be relevant. So it starts with planning. It then goes to, okay, I created a feature branch. CI activity starts happening. CI is, is an interesting observability source because on the one hand, it's not very realistic. On the other end, it's very kind of... Uh, repeatable, so it's you know always the same thing. So it's a better baseline um, to detect uh, certain uh, phenomena, and then code review, merging, then checking in with your code after you've merged it. So all of these things are tremendously interesting to include. And this brought me to kind of the critical question, which is, so so what's stopping this continuous feedback revolution that blew my mind to actually happen? Like, why aren't developers doing it more? Why is it that every second organization that I talk to either doesn't do it or has two people that do? And after, you know, being very curious about it, after talking to so many different developers, I came to the conclusion that there are three things that are behind this. And the first is expertise. So, you know, I've, I have to admit before, like I started getting into observability a year ago. Before then, my statistics skills were very rusty. I did not know a percentile uh, um, from an average, from a mean. I did not know that you can't average means and things like that. Definitely was in no position to do linear regression or to understand, to do trend analysis. I think, you know, very few developers are the performance experts that can kind of beyond kind of the obvious, which is, okay, it's extremely slow, understand that uh, the things going on and be able to kind of discern that. So, so there is a, a big expertise gap here. And for me, I don't like to do things that I'm not an expert on a lot of times, like getting out of the comfort zone is, is difficult. I, I give here the example of repairs because I'm extremely, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst handyman in the world. So I try to avoid it as much as possible. So definitely, if it's not within my realm of expertise, it might you might see in a company that there are like two people, these are the performance guys, talk to them, but then the knowledge doesn't propagate throughout the, the engineering team. The other um, is content. So basically, I'm working on the feature right now. I'm, I'm developing. It's kind of a context switch, even mentally, to start going to another tool cross-relating some data, trying to find what's interesting, and it's very taxing. There are enough context switches as is with meetings and other things that as a developer, I don't much care for. The last one, I see, I'm starting to see a lot of dashboard fatigue. There's so many different dashboards um, that, and, and using them is so reactive. So. I could go and snoop around in a dashboard and try to do all of these neat things that I just showed you where I look at the traces and I look at the dashboard and I'm, I'm comparing my changes and all of that. But if 99% of the time I wouldn't find anything or it, I'm, I'm the, the next time I would just not do it or I would probably give up long before I, I'm, I kind of um, 
manage to implement it as as a as, as a part of my dev process. So this started my whole, my personal journey with open source and continuous feedback, where I said, well. This is something I could use with the teams that I work with. And this is something that that makes sense because it's not that the information isn't there. We have we have a lot of information there. How do we actually make it useful? Again, based on all of the different tools that you've over, over already seen. Um, but removing these three impediments, how do how do I make sure that to get the information on my code, I don't need to be an expert in performance or observability. Um, and I don't need to context switch too much. And it's not a reactive process, but a proactive one. Um, and this is work in progress, but, uh, but, but I just wanted to show you kind of the potential of what we're trying to do, uh, me and a small team. Um, and, and, and then of course, encourage you to go and get it because it's, it's, it's open and free. But, um, and, and it is included as a part of the project if you just want to test it out. Um, before I do that, I do want to also invite everyone to join the continuous feedback community, which is basically developers that start kind of playing around with continuous feedback with the different, you know, Jaeger and Prometheus and even some of the commercial tools like Grafana or, or others and kind of exchanging thoughts and ideas and tools uh, uh, that that can be helpful. Uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned a few tools in this talk, but there are a lot of other interesting tools and technologies that are coming up in the open source ecosystem because everybody agreed on uh, on continuous uh, on on open telemetry as the standard. Um, so you're welcome to join the Slack group and and um, um, and learn more about it and maybe contribute from some of your experiences. But let me kind of show you the way that that I'm starting to look at it um, and I'm very committed to kind of trying to implement a process myself uh, with uh, with development that has continuous feedback and it's it's not always easy especially because again all of these different impediments so every time I see one I'm trying to kind of uh, find ways that I can kind of lock it and and uh, or or kind of circumvent the problem by making the data more accessible so I've loaded up this uh, project that I mentioned, uh, the, the example project, the Vault API, um, and you can get it from Git as well. But in this case, um, we've created a continuous feedback pipeline. So basically uh, an application that can actually ingest all of the different observability sources and try to find useful things to show me in my IDE as a developer so I can actually use them. Um, so let me, for example, open this Vault uh, service. And there's a lot of different insights here because one of the things we're, I'm trying to do right now is kind of test out the different things that we can find out. Uh, but for example, here, you can see this very simple authentication flow and you can see several things. First of all, that the CI environment revealed that it's slowing down very slowly, make it a bit bigger so everybody can see. Uh, and there's a very definite bottleneck here. And if I click on that, I can actually see more uh, information. Uh, and this is kind of what I had in mind to, to try to make it very easy for developers to access data um, in a very kind of just like IntelliSense or kind of find usages or whatever you, you would do. Um, so for example, here I can see an N plus one issue. I was using an ORM, it happens. Um, and I can click to kind of get into that. And all this is based on existing observability. This is not something that I had to uh, to work hard for. And I can see all of that information and I can go all the way to the trace that exemplifies this N plus uh, problem as, as an example. And I can see that it was called 973 times and I can see the duration and the impact. So this closes or, or kind of what I'm continually trying to hammer at is how to kind of remove more and more layers between developers and production because developers are already working very close to production. We've removed a lot of layers. Each kind of feature is kind of getting into production very quickly. The distance is shorter and, and then the feedback is also needed. And there are many different types of things that can be added because it's a pipeline. So just like a CI platform would have 
performance test or load testing and so on. And a CI platform, you know, is in charge of taking code from your source code to production. A continuous feedback pipeline is kind of the inverse of that. It takes the observability data from production, then runs it through different stages and starts finding interesting things. So we're looking at things like error hotspots that are trending or escalating or things that you know about performance usage, all sorts of things that can be included in my, uh, or useful to me in all of these different stages uh, that we were looking at before. So I just wanted to kind of give you that uh, uh, simple glimpse. If you want to play around with it, of course, you're also welcome. It, it is in the, the same repo and it's very hard uh, to get it up and running. Um, and so this is my own kind of uh, a personal uh, journey. And then I have a, a, a bonus question, but uh, just want to check if anybody has additional questions before we go. Hi, this is Jeff. Um, can you put the link to your Git repo in yes. the chat? That would be helpful, maybe. Definitely. I will, I will do it right now. Just so everyone has it. Thanks. Perfect. Um, does anybody have other questions? Is the inside data? Yes, I have a question. It's Sergey from North Carolina. Yeah, right. I'm just joining randomly different um, meetups in different states. <laughs> So here's my question. Could you please uh, go back to your slide where you point, show the source code with its advisors? To my slide where I show the source code and what? And you demonstrated how you were moving your mouse mm -hmm. and your tool showed uh, the problem, oh, like 10 plus yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, for example. So mm -hmm. imagine the situation we have uh, a team works on uh, microservices mm -hmm. and it has like 300, 400 microservices. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of developers on the team. And basically each developer doesn't know what other developers are working on exactly in this moment. Mm -hmm. And everyone is sitting on their own branch. Mm -hmm. And the line co line numbers don't match. Method names could uh, classes and methods could be restructured. Mm -hmm. How developer actually? But but in production, mm -hmm. like deploy a specific branch or a or a release branch or a master branch, uh, depending on the team mm -hmm. culture. So. How developer is sure that this advice is actually relevant to what is deployed? Mm -hmm. Because so, every developer is on its own branch. That's a really uh, great question. And when, when I got started, like I had, uh, you probably noticed that I'm, I'm a bit of a back to the future geek. And, and one of the things that kind of I had in mind just getting started was this flux capacitor triangle thing where we have on the one hand the code, on the one hand the source uh, kind of commit or release or branch, uh, and then we have the observability, and we're trying to triangulate them all together. So um, that's why when we look at different environments, for example, if this is my local environment or my CI running my branch, then we can see information that's relevant to that specific branch that I'm running this branch of the code on, and Otel can be extended and, and we've, we've, we've shown how to do it in this project to actually include the commit hash into the observability. So we can actually know uh, which version of the code the insight was based on. And then if we find that the code you're looking at is very different or changed, we can give you the option to see the original code running in the environment okay. that you're examining where that code actually happens versus your local end, for example. But this is a great, uh, it, it, you're right, it, it's a great dilemma on, on how to make it uh, effective, especially if, the, if, if you're making uh, a lot of changes and you want to make sure that you're seeing the, the, them in, in, you know, in, in time, not just as a something static. Okay, thank you. Um, another thing is that some uh, insights span 
different releases. So you're right. We're, we're doing a lot of work to to make sure adjustments when I change the code, move the code that we know when it's relevant and when not. But it's very interesting to know if something started happening or stopped happening after a change. So like when we got started on the data analysis part of this project, the easy part was noticing something happened. The more complicated part was knowing when I fixed it to, to stop showing that it's happening because mm -hmm. you know because of the all of the different uh, data analysis problems that you guys are familiar with because of the the fact that data isn't a flat line it's always all over the place and you need to apply probability to understand okay what are the chances that this looks like it's it's not happening anymore and this is actually interesting because it's something that would be very difficult for a developer to do if you were not using such a platform yeah and the second question mm -hmm. if uh, uh, a team is working with several environments like development environment for example yeah. a developer can start its own group of microservices it's, it's in its own kubernetes cluster then there is a common team deployment development and uat and production yeah. how can we point to different environments <laughs> so this is called uh deployment environments in OTA yeah. terms and as you can see here by the way i have uh, information from different environments. For example, this code um, wasn't reached in the CI. In fact, uh, if, I'm, if I see it here, I see that it's not reached in the CI environment. I still see critical things from production because it's really important for me to see it. But I can kind of cycle between the different environments to see how the code behaves in each one of them. Okay. So yeah, deployment environments are, are an, an important concept. Um, and you want to make sure that you separate them because these environments also behave very differently. For example, if you have the CI environment and I don't know, the, it's failing, it's red, then you fix it. You don't want all of that noise because you already fixed it, right? Or if you're using your local dev environment, then obviously, you know, there, there are a lot of things as you write the code, you're going to have a lot of issues. It doesn't mean that you want them to bug you. So each one of them has to be kind of separated into its own environment. Um, and there were a lot of interesting things that we added to kind of make that uh, nicer. For example, um, this came from kind of working on this platform. Um, we noticed that, well, we want to diagnose things like time, but what if we're debugging and we're kind of in a breakpoint? So we added the plugin, the or we added to the plugin the capability to report that right now we're in a breakpoint. So the, the backend pipeline knows to ignore the specific trace in terms of performance because it's not going to tell us anything. It's just going to be very long uh, and things like that, just to make it a bit easier to work with in different uh, permutations and environments. Thank you. Um, I see a question. Is the insight coming from a dev environment? Can you get the same from other ends? So this insight is coming from uh, production that I put up. I have here some CI service that I have as well. And some, some, some of it has kind of details associated with it and some doesn't. Again, it's very noisy because I'm creating a lot of noise here to test all of my alarms work. Um, but um, the, the dev environment is interesting also because um, the way that we think about it, your local dev environment is something that may be useful to you, but as other developers, it, I'm not necessarily interested in your local dev environment. So kind of the visibility is by default one that developers each have access to their own dev environment and how it performs um, and not necessarily be kind of flooded by alerts from other devs. Any other questions? I have a question. So um, I, I don't know a whole lot about open telemetry. So this is more kind of on the basics of that. So mm -hmm. the things you're capturing, are these effectively uh, the points are like where you're making a call between services and making a network access? Mm -hmm. Or is it kind of more fine grained than that? So the first thing that I'm capturing, and this happens automatically when you enable these uh, 
uh, packages that do the automatic instrumentation is they're they're kind of telling you things are happening by these platforms. So fast API will tell you a REST API was triggered. Uh, SQL Alchemy will tell you I'm running a query and so on. Um, and that information will flow into the system. But then in terms of your domain logic, you might want to include kind of your own tracing that will tell you, well, I started this activity or kind of this is the context where these three operations are running as a part of uh, and so on. Now, of course you wanna be judicious. So OTEL is kind of, you can think about, I, I think about tracing like uh, very similar to logging in terms of performance. If you trace all the time, every small function, then it's going to add up. But if you trace your higher level flows, it's probably not going to mean anything compared to kind of all of the other complex stuff that you're doing in the application. So um, it, in, in that context, I did introduce some tracing to allow me more granular, a uh, more granular way to look at various flows within each of these boxes. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay, I think that's it then. Oh, yeah, wait, awesome. Oh, one more, one more. <laughs> oh. Hey, is there any other performance impact for the end user of the app when using the hotel? So uh, again, I, I'll be very hesitant to say like uh, no, because you know, of course you can get to a situation where there is a performance impact. And so I think this kind of relates to my previous answer where it's really about using it judiciously. If, 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 if you have, uh, a thread that's running a loop that's uh, running through a lot of cycles and in each of them you log a trace, then you're going to impact the end user inadvertently. But if you add it to your stack on your web server, like as a middleware, it's not, it's, it's going to be very negligible. It's not going to be something you'll notice. Um, yeah, that's, I think that, that's the short on that one. Great. Well, thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Yeah, very uh, interesting. Thanks for having me. And uh, I just want to mention this is a really new field, and you're you're starting to see other other um, people are getting interesting in it. In it, uh, you, you can start seeing all of the APMs start looking at developers, eyeing them, and seeing them taking more ownership and responsibilities so trying to address them. So continuous feedback is something new that's kind of shaping up. So um, I'm also inviting you guys to join the Slack to contribute to the discussions and help us kind of think about what are the basis, basic tenants and or, or even kind of manifest uh, that we want to, to define for continuous feedback so that we can have better tooling. Great. Thanks a lot again for inviting me.